Good morning, friends. Good to see all of you, and welcome to our service of worship today. Today is Pentecost Sunday. On this day, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Jesus, who had gathered in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and the power of heaven's love filled them. And from that time and place, the disciples went out and turned the world upside down. Let me share just a couple of announcements before we begin our service of worship. Uh, There's an announcement about uh, we've uh, extended a position to a woman named Delin, and I'm thinking I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Uh, Seodo, or I, I I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but I will after Monday, okay? She starts tomorrow, and um, one of these Sundays, we will invite her uh, to be here so you all can meet her. Um, She's a delightful woman, and uh, she impressed the members of our committee who have extended um, the position to her. Um, uh, Joyce has agreed to continue to work with her for two more weeks uh, to train her, and um, so we appreciate that, Joyce. And um, like I say, um, we're looking forward to having her uh, join us uh, and our staff. A week from Tuesday, the Missions Committee will be meeting. A week from Saturday, there will be a memorial service for Don Burgess and uh, Don Jr. Are there any other announcements that we need to share for the good of the group? If not then uh, I invite those who are able to rise and let us sing our opening song, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. As we come to this time of prayer and our service of worship, I invite all of us to turn our 
our hearts and our minds to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your presence here with us this day. We thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you opened us to heaven's truths. Guide all of us in the ways of Jesus. Renew our spirits. Help us to see your presence more clearly. And when selfish and rebellious thoughts come to us, we pray that your spirit will restore us to obedience to your will. We seek your help and your comfort, O God, and we pray that in the midst of all the anxieties that we experience in the course of our days, in the presence of all the challenges that life brings our way, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, our lives may produce good fruit and we may experience things like your joy, peace, and patience, your goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Oh God, we pray that your presence will be felt in, our lar in the larger community throughout our nation. There are so many incidents in which people are shooting one another. And we just pray that your spirit will be in the midst of all that's going on and that we will be able to find other ways to uh, confront each other in the midst of our anger and disappointments so that people don't have to die or be seriously injured. Help all of us, O oh God, to learn how to better interact with those with whom we disagree so that we can work out our differences peaceably. Today, O oh God, we lift up prayers for Teddy, for Paul Niran, for Paul Wise, for Joan, for Diane, for Lois and Joyce and Jeff. You know, O oh God, what it is these persons need most. And we pray that your spirit will be with them. That, um, that your spirit will, will help them to meet all of their needs. We lift up prayers for the president of our nation and for the leaders of all the nations all around the world. Let your spirit guide them in the ways of peace with justice. And now, O oh God, in the silence of these moments, each and every one of us comes to you with our own thoughts and prayers and petitions. And now, O oh God, hear us as we lift to you the words to the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, from the second chapter. I'll begin reading at the first verse, but I invite us to, uh, to pray before I begin reading the text. Oh God, as we come to you to hear your word for us this day, I pray that you, your spirit would open our minds and our hearts to all it is that you have to share with us, that we may forever after be faithful disciples of your son Jesus. In his name we pray it. Amen. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. Why, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, here ends our reading from our scriptures this day. May God's Spirit be with us as we seek to understand and apply the truths of this experience to our own spiritual lives. Amen.
there is no clearer before and after picture of, of the disciples of Jesus than what happened on the day of Pentecost. Prior to Pentecost, the celebration described in our text for today, even before the resurrection, even before the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, before these events, the disciples experienced the living presence of Jesus of Nazareth. And let me add, they were enthralled. They were his students. They listened carefully to what he taught. Oh, they didn't always understand, and they certainly didn't apply what they heard to their lives. But as I say, they were enthralled. Then he was crucified. He was dead and buried. And even though they were the first to experience the resurrection, they didn't fully understand what that could mean for them. In fact, after the resurrection, Jesus had told them simply to wait. So they waited. That's the before picture. If a photograph could have been taken of them, they probably would have appeared to have a questioning look on their faces. And, okay, what do we do now? Kind of look. That was before Pentecost. What they didn't know is how Pentecost was about to change them, for they were about to be clothed with power from on high. Now, Pentecost is a Jewish festival. It is also known as the Festival of Weeks. There are two growing seasons in Palestine, one in the fall and one in the spring. And when the harvest comes, for one or the other, it is a cause for great celebration. In the Jewish religion, Pentecost comes 50 days after the Passover celebration. I suspect that the disciples of Jesus had gathered in Jerusalem for the Pentecost and sought each other out, getting together in those places where they had previously met. Now, Pentecost usually arrives in the late spring or early summer. And when Pentecost arrived 50 days following the resurrection of Jesus, his disciples were about to get a crash course in heavenly power. It began with the wind. You probably remember what Jesus had told Nicodemus about the Holy Spirit. He told Nicodemus that the wind blows wherever it it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Following the wind at Pentecost, described in our text for today, there came heavenly flames which came to rest on the disciples. Apparently they, like Jesus, we're about to set the world on fire. That was proved by what they then spoke. They may have been speaking in their native Galilean speech, but what those who were present heard was something entirely different. The words they heard were in their own native languages, like Latin and Greek, Arabian and Egyptian. Those listening were astounded. If we had been there, we would have been astounded too. I mean, how would our video technician, Brian Baker, had he been there, how might he have responded? I can imagine him looking at his equipment and going, hmm, something must be wrong with this equipment. And these people from all over the ancient Mediterranean world wondered, what does this mean? And we may wonder the same thing. What does this mean for you and me as followers of Jesus? You can picture, can't you, people outside the building suddenly crowd, crowding in. They cocked their heads and listened, trying to make sense of whatever was going on. What we know 
and they didn't, is that the Holy Spirit is a phenomenal linguist and is able to communicate with all people everywhere. These people were baffled. Here was something that bypassed human reasoning. Some of the people present tried to dismiss what was going on by suggesting that these disciples were drunk. But Peter suggested, no, nah, they're not drunk. It's, why, it's only nine in the morning. No one gets drunk that early in the day. At least I hope not. And then it hit Peter. A scripture text from the prophet Joel suddenly leaped into his mind. Now, friends, do not discount such a thing. For this is often how the Holy Spirit works in your life and in mine. The words to a scripture text will suddenly hit us. Like they say, hit us like a ton of bricks. And so Peter preached the first sermon of his life that morning. He talked about the Spirit being poured out upon people. According to our scripture text today, 3,000 people were touched by what Peter had to say. So touched, in fact, that they, like the 11 disciples, wanted to become disciples of Jesus. It was a miraculous response. Many scholars think of this occasion as the birthday of the church. It certainly was a new beginning in the life of the 11 and in the lives of those who responded that day. They would be the first fruits of those who would go out and turn this world upside down. Yes, what happened in that place spread throughout Judea and Samaria and Galilee and on into Alexandria and Egypt and on into Ethiopia and Arabia and then on into the cities of what today is Turkey, cities like Laodicea and Ephesus and Macedonia and from there on into the nation of Greece and still on in, into the nation of Rome. And because of what happened in Jerusalem on Pentecost, the story of Jesus has been spread all around the world. All of this happened because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the scriptures speak about the Holy Spirit in at least two different ways. First, the scriptures speak of the Holy Spirit as the abiding presence of God in Jesus Christ with all the the safety and comfort that such a presence brings us. This is the spirit most of us know and love, for it brings peace and concord to us. It soothes our souls. It revives the weary. It is always with us, especially when we have the good sense to breathe in and say, thank you, God. That's the first way that we know the Holy Spirit. But there is a second way, and it is manifested in our lives as followers of Jesus. And this way is not nearly so comforting. This is the Spirit which, like the wind, howls down the chimney, which blows through the backyard and scatters the lawn furniture all around the backyard. Ask Job, and he'll tell you it's, it's like a tornado. Ask Ezekiel, and he'll tell you it knits dry, dead bones back together and breathes new life into dead bodies. Or ask Peter, James, and John, and they'll tell you it transforms someone from an ordinary human body into a vision of heavenly light. Now, friends, something like that happened to me. Before I met Patricia, I was very skeptical of the rel relatively new movement within Christianity called Pentecostalism. However, after we had been dating for a while, and she began to attend the church where I was the pastor on Sunday mornings, I thought it only f fair that I attend the Pentecostal church where she was a member on Sunday evenings. 
That's fair. Now, their services were different from what I was accustomed to. They began at 7 o'clock, and sometimes we didn't get through until 9 or 9.30. There was a band which was led by a pianist and included guitarists and a drummer and sometimes a saxophonist and a flautist. There were never fewer than three in the band. And we sang and clapped and raised our hands in the air. Meanwhile, the children wandered throughout the sanctuary. They crawled under the pews to play or read or color in their coloring books while their parents praised God and danced in place. And when they tired, the children often fell asleep on the pews right next to their parents. There were moments when someone spoke out loud in strange tongues and others interpreted for the congregation what they had heard. People came forward where hands were placed on their heads and shoulders and everyone prayed for them. Some were what they call slain in the spirit and fainted away. The elders of the church caught them as they fell and gently laid them on the carpet. It was like being in the midst of a thunderstorm. When I first started attending, I secretly prayed that the lightning would not strike me. Thank you very much. Later, I became more open. My initial response, I imagine, must have been something like, what was going on for those people gathered in that space in our scripture reading, where Peter preached his first sermon on Pentecost, and everyone who was there wondered, what in the world is going on? Now, friends, am I the only one here this morning who would have reacted like that? Well, I see some heads nodding. Who else wants an umbrella when it looks like the Spirit is about to start coming down with wind and fire? Huh? I suspect that's precisely where the disciples were that day. And that's where we are more times than we'd like to admit. That's where we often are as individuals and as members of this particular body of Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ, born on that day that we call Pentecost. Now, friends, it's no crime to pray for the gentle presence of God's Spirit, to ask God to restore predictability, to remove us from areas of risk, to give back the comfortable illusion of control so that we can sleep soundly at night. But my friends, Pentecost is our reminder that there is another side to God's Spirit. One that sets us on fire, transforms our lives, and turns our world upside down. This side of the Holy Spirit is not predictable. It asks us to take risks on behalf of God and Jesus. To step out of the ordinary and experience the ways of God which are beyond our ability to control. Like Job and the whirlwind. Like Ezekiel who watched dry bones come back to life. Like Peter and James and John who saw a whole other side to the person of Jesus when he was transfigured. Or like me who was introduced to a whole other style of worship on Sunday evenings. about the only thing a person can do when the Holy Spirit blows in our lives, in the face of such storms, about the only thing that you and I can do is to fold up our umbrellas and put them away and open ourselves to the movement of the Holy Spirit. In doing so, my friends, in allowing ourselves to be directed by the Spirit of God, 
like the disciples in today's text, we will be clothed with a heavenly power from on high. May you be so blessed. Amen. I want to thank all of you for your continued and continuing support of St. John's United Church of Christ, um, for your financial gifts, and for your gifts of time and energy um, to help this church continue its ministry. And that light, I'd like to offer a prayer and dedicate our gifts to God. Let us pray. Oh God, I thank you for the generosity of the members of this church who continue to support its ministry financially and through their efforts, with their energies, their time, and all that they do. I pray that you will richly bless them in return. Use all of our gifts to further your work here in our community of Mansfield and all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.
Friends go out into the world and work to bring forth new life. Pay attention to heaven's dreams. Open your eyes to heaven's visions. Speak of God's goodness. Show others the presence of God's love. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.